That way I look a lot smarter if I put my glasses on. You guys tell me when you want me to get started. We good? What time does everybody have? Is it a little after one? Okay, great. <clears throat> well, two hours is a long time to go, but uh, we're going to go there. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a combination of pitches I've sort of put together that would usually go about four or five hours. So we're going to condense them, uh, and I'm going to throw a lot of information at you. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to talk about space medicine applications for terrestrial wellness, human performance, and longevity. And I'll be coming to you as a flight surgeon because that's been sort of my day job here at NASA for the last uh, 20 years, uh, 20 years as of last April, um, working the clinics, uh, supporting the astronauts uh, as they fly. They do MBL runs, working mission control. I've done about, supported about 26 shuttle missions and two long duration missions. Uh, and then I've been uh, basically working the clinic the last couple of years. I run the clinic. And so some dis disclosures. Uh, this is the other stuff I do. I'm on the clinical faculties at UTMB uh, and at Wright State, the Departments of Aerospace and Preventive Medicine. I uh, trained in internal medicine and aerospace medicine, and aerospace medicine is basically taking very healthy people and put them in, putting them in a very unique environment. Um, uh, I'm been, presently, I'm the medical director for the Occupational and Flight Medicine Clinics. I'm the lead for the Wellness and Human Performance Program and the ISS Fatigue Management Team. Hey, come on in. Hey. Welcome. You messed up my introduction. You were going to introduce me? Yes, I was. Oh, I didn't know that. I, <laughs> yeah, that I was just going to make it easy on everybody. I'll do it at the end. Do you want to do it at the end? <laughs> okay. Well, I have some little known facts that I want all of them to know. Oh, then let's wait till the end. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, I am on an advisory board for, uh, uh, and I also do the lead, I do the medical standards for the astronauts and the international. I'm also on the advisory board for Virgin Galactic and I'm on the scientific advisory board for lighting sciences and I'm on the board of directors for uh, Houston Hospice and Palliative Care. Uh, two of the things that one of my great mentors in, in, in residency and med school said, you'll probably, he said, what are you going to end up doing? I said, I don't know. He said, well, you're probably end doing the things that kind of get you upset the most and the things that we don't do well are end of life care and uh, preventive medicine. So those are kind of my passions and that's where I'm coming from. That's what this whole talk's about today or discussing those sorts of things. Uh, I've been a research consultant with uh, injury reduction technology. I'll show you with, uh, as far as um, some publications we've done with them. I am on was on the over, Oversight Advisory Committee for National Science Foundation Polar Medicine Program and was on the internal medicine department at the, the VA hospital and was a medical officer at Wiley from 91 to 94. So I've been here since 1991. Hey, welcome everybody. And uh, I have no financial relationships uh, than those to disclose as far as making any money off of those things that have anything to do with today's talk. So get that out of the way. So, space medicine, applications for terrestrial wellness, human performance, and longevity. That's what we're here to talk about. Uh, it all comes down to family, okay? A lot of it. And uh, of course, we've all got a little, you know, crazy uncle that's always going the wrong direction of the family. <laughs> but you learn a lot in medicine. That's one of the first things we do is ask about family and your family history. And so genetics, as you know, is becoming more and more important. And we know from twin studies that basically genes are about 20 to 30 percent of us, okay? The rest of it is environment and how our genes handle those environmental. Uh, stressors. And there's some populations that outlive us uh, by eight to ten years with only one year's difference in uh, d death rate between male and females and we'll talk about those. Uh, so personalized genomic medicine is is really something that I'm just going to touch on. This is actually a, a whole talk in itself but I'm just I've got a few slides. Uh, it, it's trying to individualize what your genetic susceptibilities are and your strengths are and how you can use those to target different medical therapies. And everyone is an individual. I've got 
14, 15 people on the space station and everyone's going to work, you know, is maybe taking a different sleep medicine and you've probably heard in the paper about astronauts taking all these sleep medicines and I'm happy to discuss that also, which is we do use a lot of sleep meds, but we ground test them and we've developed a, a very unique program on how to do that. In other words, you want the right medicine at the right dose, at the smallest amount of dose you can to work. Every time I prescribe I hurt my arm or leg, you know, what's the right dose of Motrin or ibuprofen or Tylenol for somebody? So we're, we're kind of always kind of trying to titrate that medicine to the right dose. So let's talk basics. Let's talk genetics. Very basic. We've got about 20,000 genes in us with about 6 billion base pairs. And what is a gene? A gene is simply something in your body that codes and makes a protein that goes and does something and may or may not affect how you end up with a disease, a disease or not, okay? Or av avoids a disease. Um, and so it's simply a genotype is you've got these six billion base pairs that we can, we can now copy and, and look at. And then we look at people that have certain diseases and we see if there are associations. It may not be cause and effect, but there's something going on with this gene that because it gets hit by this environmental stimulus, makes a protein that may afford us to be susceptible to this disease. And so that's, those are the basics, and that's the 20 to 30 percent of the equation that we'll, we'll talk about. Now, genotype, this would be a phenotype of Michael Phelps as a, at a very young age, okay? As he is swimming faster than these other little folks trying to get to the Golden Prize, but we all know the environment is huge, that if Michael Phelps smokes too much pot or doesn't exercise, that he is not going to make it to the Golden Prize. <laughs> trying to throw a little humor, trying to keep you awake. And my plane got in at uh, 3.30 last night, so I'm, I'm at about a 25 to 30% deficit right now, so I'll, I'll be stuttering a lot, um, which I do anyway. The bottom line is Houston is, is home to one of the genomes, one of the six genome projects. It took about $3 billion and we sequenced, or not we, they sequenced uh, Watson's DNA. It took two months and a million dollars to do that. Um, the good news is that the revolutionary, the revolution in technology, polymer, it's chain reaction. You basically splay that DNA open and you photocopy it. And because the technology has gotten so incredible, what used to take a million dollars in 2007, we're now doing the, the Kelly twins. Okay, we're flying identical twins. We're going to have Scott Kelly in orbit, and we're going to have Mark Kelly on the ground, and they're going to be controls for each other. So now we're going to hopefully get to see a little bit, an end of one, of what the space environment, uh, and that's what we'll talk about, uh, what kind of effect it has on at least one pair of twins. Uh, so Mark will hopefully on the ground be acting as a control, doing similar experiments, you know, eating similar foods, all that just not being exposed to the radiation, the carbon dioxide, and all that kind of stuff. The other neat thing we can do is you don't have to sequence all six billion base pairs. You can actually, there are high targeted uh, uh, genetic markers that you can do. It's called a gene chip. So instead of looking at the 20,000 genes, you can look at around 1,000 genes that we already know a great deal about. And you can find out a, a wealth of information on that. And I'll show you, I'm going to use Myself as an example, in 2013, it's $350 to go get a gene chip, which now you can go uh, for 23andMe, you can go online. I'll take you online. You can put down $99. They'll send you a little box. You spit in the box. You send the box back with the mailman. And four to six weeks later, it comes back with a, a fairly a wealth of information on, on gene chips and, and your traits your inherited conditions, things that you could pass on that aren't good, like cystic fibrosis and those sorts of things to your, to your kids. Uh, it will tell you, uh, report on 240 health conditions. Uh, it also got squashed by the FDA back in, the, in, in November because it didn't jump through certain hoops and it was revealing information that they didn't think it was sort of false advertising. Like you're going to go in here, people say you've got this gene, and they were kind of freaking out. If you get the gene, you're going to get it. If you've got the Alzheimer's uh, genes, you're going to get Alzheimer's. No, 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 not at all. And people go, well, you know, why would you want to know that? And certain people don't want to know that. Well, I would explain to you that you do want to know that because there's a lot of stuff you can do to prevent it. 
Okay, it's the environment, and that's what we have to. That's what you have to understand. You you have your risk of Alzheimer's by walking 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Okay, so you can probably make huge differences in the food you eat and, 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 and the amount of exercise and the things that you do. So they're working with the FDA and I'm happy to show you my 23andMe. You can go in and join 23andMe for $99. It's a wealth of information um, and, uh, and it will, you'll find out about Ancestry. I think it's starting to try to be a chat room. Like I get notifications, oh, you know, 13 of your fourth cousins just signed up to 23andMe. <laughs> do you, do you want to chat with them? No, I don't. I don't. No, no, no. So they're very good about privacy issues. And uh, the problem with some of this stuff is you can't, uh, you can't lose your, um, your health insurance now because of legislation. Uh, you could lose your life insurance. Like the information I'm going to show you on myself today, if my life insurance policy knew about this, and I have life insurance through NASA, what am I doing? No, uh, you know, if they wanted to, if they were bad people, they could they could get rid of your insurance. And so those laws are in the works to try to be in place. Because what we need to do is we all have strengths and weaknesses. We all need to pool our resources to help everybody. There's always going to be a rash in healthcare, um, but. Um, and I am doc of the day, hold on, in the clinic. And I will probably just turn, hold on. Okay, sorry. Um, I've got a resident over there, so he'll be fine. But anyway, so, uh, and I'll walk you through this. Uh, bottom line, you know, uh, having some genetic information might tell us who, this person's not ill or injured, he just landed in a Soyuz, okay? Who is and these folks were on the same mission, and one guy's neurovestibular system is doing pretty well, the other's is not. So that would help inform us, you know, what genes, it's not bad that you've got very sensitive neurovestibular system, they help you in some ways, it's just they don't help you be a fighter pilot or, or, uh, or an astronaut when you're returning uh, from, from zero G. So my whole deal, I'm going to speed it up now, or I'll, we'll be here all day, is looking at the genome, look at the environment, and how does that equate into wellness. And then I want to throw another hook in it, which a lot of people don't do, and that's longevity, okay? Because it's not just about the astronaut's career or mission, although that's a big deal, and I'll give you examples of that as I, as I talk. It's also now, I, I have the great pleasure of taking care of a lot of the retired folks. You know, I sat down with one this morning for about two hours with a medical list like this. Um, and actually, those are the folks that, that I'd like to talk about. And that's what, since I'm turning 60 here in another month, I'm kind of interested in that also. Uh, and it's nothing grandma didn't tell you. You know, it's what you eat, it's what you breathe, it's your fitness, it's your strength, and it's your psychological well-being. And the number one question I ask to see how someone's doing psychologically is a very simple question. How are you sleeping? Okay, it's like my fifth vital sign. Okay, um, so that's very important. If you're sleeping well, you're probably doing well. Okay, and we'll talk more about that. I'm also going to try to talk about, again, go through this, but I'm going to try to give you my gestalt of my uh, experience on, you know, what you should be eating, what you shouldn't be eating, you know, what you should be doing, or this and that, or the, the fact that they're, they're a continuum. They're all four things that work together. If I and I'll use myself as an example in, in my genetics and my medical conditions. You know, if I uh, haven't slept well, which I haven't, uh, if I haven't exercised, which I haven't in the last two days, uh, and if I'm under some stress, I am, uh, then I eat my twigs. You know, I make sure I eat my vegetables. I don't eat anything that, that can predispose my endothelial wall, the lining of my blood vessels, to aging. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, so, what to eat? Well, you know, Time Magazine one day has all these great things like, you know, kale and, and vegetables and fruits and lean meats, and the next day they come out and say, eat, eating butter is fine, okay? <laughs> so, they're both right. I'm just going to, the problem is we eat too much of the dang stuff, okay? So, it's not that it's bad for you. It's also, it's moderation, and it's also how we cook it. Okay, if we overcook it, like with our meats, and it's also chemicals, and I'll talk about that. You know, we do a really good job of blowing up plants and smoking cattle. We, do, we, do, we eat a lot of smoked beef. So again, it's what we eat and what we breathe, 
and we have really fast horses here, and also the chemicals that are probably in our foods. Uh, and that's what the, our most preventable diseases are. Again, it's smoking and obesity, okay? Compared to all these other things. And it's kind of eating our lunch. Uh, we are living longer, but as a society, we're not living healthier. Although there are some indicators that we may be sort of changing those things. I mean, you just, you, you see how incredible the obesity is out there. Uh, and so that sets you up for chronic inflammatory problems. And we'll talk about that. Uh, depending on where you live in, in this area, uh, you're going to have more asthma. You're going to have two to three times more lung cancers. You just saw the whole thing on Galena Park, you know, with, with the diesel trucks going through, and they're having a spike in cancer. Uh, so it matters, you know, depending if you live downtown. I just was in New York a few weeks ago, and I just, it was a warm day, and it, there is no breeze there. It's just high buildings. It was <gasps> throughout the whole day. So we know that when the ozone layers are high or the particulate matter is really, really high, you're going to have more heart attacks. You're going to clog yourself up. Air pollution will kill you. And if you live in northern China, you die <coughs> five years sooner than if you live in southern China. That's because that's where the coal plants are. Um, so that's why this thing that we've all built in this room, and we should feel very proud of that, um, is just a great environment because it's such a closed loop environment and it's such a great laboratory uh, not only for aerospace engineering and, and, and uh, you know working together but also as a, as a medical platform which is what a lot of us have spent our lives working on and you know it matters what you breathe this is Dan basically cleaning the filters because dust floats that's why we use a lot of antihistamines. We have a lot of chronic congestion up in space. It's, um, it can be a real problem for, for folks. Yeah, what we eat is so important. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then exercise. Uh, we've been working, of course, with the medical problems of space, which we'll talk about. Uh, exercise, we've, we've come a long way in developing exercise programs for our folks. That's Dr. Mike Barrett, who I train with up at uh, Wright State University in Dayton and had the privilege of working with him as a flight doc and now as, a, as an astronaut. Uh, and the good news is we're getting smarter. I mean, a lot of people, you know, what's, what's going on with the space program? You guys still doing anything? So we've never worked harder. We've got six people in orbit all the time. And it's, it's amazing what we're learning. And, and here, this is just on our, our problem of floating and osteoporosis, uh, losing all that calcium. Uh, and here's Here's what we've learned from, this is zero, this is your, no loss, and this is where most people came back after being up in space for three to six months on their hip, total hip. This was the Mir space station, usually at about an 8% decrement in total bone mass on a DEXA scan, some people down here. Then we got the IS, ISS IRED, uh, inter, uh, inter resistive exercise device, we got better. Then we got the A-RED, we got better, and then we used bisphosphonates. We've used medications, we've gotten really, really good on vitamin D levels. And so now some of our folks are coming back with normal bone mass. So that's a really good thing. So what I'm gonna do today is talk about the role of genetics, environment, nutrition, fitness, psychological well-being, and astronaut health and wellness. And explain all the things that we've done in space medicine pre-flight, screening, in-flight countermeasures, post-flight longitudinal occupational surveillance programs, which I think we need more and more of, uh, and how that's going to contribute to astronaut and cosmonaut health. And then I'm going to try to apply all these things to our day-to-day -day lives. What, what, we, what are we learning from these folks? And it's, it's kind of fun stuff. And we're going to have a good time, too, because you never know what's going to pass by. And I was sitting in the line at a grocery store, and Dan called me on the cell phone going, what is this? this I didn't know this it was the Lovejoy Comet. And I didn't know what it was either, but it just shot by. Okay, so what do I get to do? I get to take some of the healthiest people in the world, because we screen them, and put them, that's the original Mercury 7, of course, and put them in some of the funkiest environments you could imagine. And it is, you know, the uniqueness of space, uh, the fluid shifts are interesting, um, things are just different. Uh, again, bone loss because of disused osteoporosis, vestibular problems, fluid shifts, uh, and radiation. Uh, and radiation is a big deal, okay? And also a high carbon dioxide environment, okay? And 
So, and then the other thing that we've made the news lately is sleep. And it's, it can be a very user unfriendly place to sleep. Loud, back pain, you're, you're two centimeters taller or three centimeters taller, you're two centimeters taller, one or two every morning you wake up. And then you stand up and you squash your spine. Uh, you don't do that up in orbit and it takes sometimes weeks and months before that, that back pain goes away. Some astronauts will tell you they never slept better when they get up in space, but a majority of them have a tough time because of the stresses, of the schedules, and I will also show you the lack of a day-night cycle, which is really important, and that's one of the spin-offs that we'll talk about. Uh, if you're hearing about an astronaut being sick, then I'm, do, I'm not doing my job. I've mouthed off too much, okay? But astronauts do get sick just like all of us, and these are some of the things that we've fixed. Kidney stone, prostate cancer, brain tumors, coronary disease, shoulder surgeries, diverticulitis, VTAC. These are things that we've fixed and flown. We've had AFib. We've had five ablations of atrial fibrillation. We didn't fly all those folks, but there's a lot of stuff there, okay? Uh, and one of the biggest complaints upon the shuttle and medical events, this is a presentation I gave a few years back, Space adaptation syndrome, yes, but insomnia and fatigue is, again, one of the big things that we battle with, and that's one of the big things I'll talk about here uh, on fatigue, and it makes a difference as far as how you perform and how long you live and how well you live. And again, uh, having this platform, having the International Space Station, and living for long periods of time with a lot of folks, lo and behold, you find out what's going on. We've got a visual impairment intracranial pressure problem. Okay, it's just been coming out in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the lay population now of several publications. So what's going on there? Well, people are not draining their brain well. That fluid shift going up. I mean, think of if you basically lived at an eight degree head down tilt all the time. Some astronauts said they feel like they've got their head in their lap a lot of the time. So you lose, like right now, if you put an ultrasound probe on my neck right now and looked at my jugular vein that's draining my brain, you wouldn't find it because there'd be so little blood flow. If you lie me flat, that vein is going to go whoom, like this. Now, if I sit here and strain real hard because my heart and my lungs are pushing and blocking that flow, this, whoa, I got my sunglasses on? Hold on. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, you, you, uh, you wouldn't, if I strained, you'd see this thing open up because it, you would impede the flow of blood from your brain down to your heart. Well, if you're lying in a head down tilt, it's going uphill. You also lose the back drainage from the vertebral system of the back, so you're not draining as well. And so what we're actually seeing is this part of the optic nerve and disc are actually getting inflamed. Cerebral spinal fluid is in the blue, and we're seeing this thing push forward, and we're seeing visual changes. We obviously saw visual changes, just if you're tired you'll see a half a diopter visual change. Or when you first get up in the morning, if you happen to sleep on your face like this, you've been pushing on your eyeball, you'll see visual changes. But then we started to see significant changes. Uh, and, and that's because the back of the eyeball here is getting flattened. And why is this? And we're actually seeing other things going on in the back of the retina. Well, there's the fluid shift. You're getting puffy and you're not draining your brain as well. We're doing a lot of resistive exercise. Well, what does that do? That increases your, your pressure. There are probably some metabolic genetic factors, which uh, uh, somebody's given a grand rounds on Scott Smith next week. Carbon dioxide is a big deal. Carbon dioxide seems to be the boogaboo for the planet. It's also tough for us, too. We have about five to ten times the amount of carbon dioxide that we have in this room right now up on the space station. So <coughs> carbon dioxide is a potent cerebrovasal dilator. It probably upregulates your, your cerebrospinal fluid. And therefore, you're, you're upregulating your metabolism and you're, not, you're, not, you're also having a trouble, problem draining it. So you're, you're making more of a metabolite and you're having more trouble draining it. And that's not good. Venous occlusion, if you happen to have a big neck and your sternocleidomastoid matches up with your carotid and your jugular in just the wrong way or the right way, it's good for you while you're here, but if you're up in space, those things impede your jugular from draining your brain. And then finally, I'd tell you that, yeah, Dr. Barger published uh, using ActiWatch that during docked ops, the astronauts average about 4.7 hours of sleep a night. 
and then during regular ops around six hours a night. Now all of us at a time would say, hey, that's pretty good, six hours. No, it, it's not. And we got to get over that. We were younger and we could get away with it. Uh, that's why I quit working emergency rooms. You know, I could do the 7P to 7A and come in and work. Uh, and then after I got to be, you know, around 50, 50, I couldn't, I could do it, but I couldn't recover. It'd take two or three days before, and I was probably not a, a happy dad or a husband at that time. You know, so that's why, you know, sleep is important. It, it's, it, it's also, and I'll talk about sleep, that's also where you drain your brain when you're sleeping. You do a lot of other things. So sleep, I think, adds to this syndrome, too. Okay, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, astronauts not only get sick, but astronauts also die. There's only one person in this photo that's still alive, okay, and that's John Glenn. He's our oldest astronaut. He's 93 years old. So let's look at that. Now, we've added four more to this since this came out in 2012. Let's just look at this for a second. This is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve from the insurance companies. All right, so let's look at this. At the age of 30 down here, everybody see pretty well? <coughs> is okay? Okay. At the age of 30, and please, if I say something that's just so ridiculous or you go, what? Just stop, raise your hand, talk. We're going to take questions and that at the end of this. But at the age of 30, almost 99% of us are still alive. Now this is the mortality curve. So this black line are normal males in the U.S. of A. Survival. So at 30, 99% of us are alive. At 100, 0.02% of us are alive. There's 63,000 of us out there over the age of 100, and I'm going to end the talk talking about those folks. Um, so this is a normal curve. So what does that mean? If you're a male in this country, and by the way, females are over this way because they don't do watch this as much as we do. Okay. Um, 80, at 80 years of age, right here, about 40% of folks, if you're a normal male in this country, are alive. Now, what are these lines? These lines are if you've never significantly smoked a cigarette. I mean, like, you know, you get over 20, 30 pack years, that's, you know, that, that's significant. But if, you, if you've never really smoked very much, or it's been over 20 years since you have, then you move the line over here. And if you're a normal weight person, you move the line over here. If you're normal weight and you've never smoked, you move the line way over here, okay? So that means if you're 80 years old and you've never smoked and never in a normal way, well, about 80% of the time you're alive at, at 80 years of age, okay? Well, how are the astronauts doing? They're not doing really well, and that's because of Challenger and Columbia and Apollo 1 and some, uh, and some airplane accidents. And, and they don't really see the benefits until they get out here in their 80s, and this is 93. Now, if you take the flight tragedies out, yeah, they're doing exactly where we'd expect them to be, okay? We think we've got very healthy people that take care of themselves, and, and that's one of the, the jobs I'd like to continue to do here, even after I leave, is to, is to, is to watch after this group of folks. And there's probably a, a, a standard deviation here that means some folks could even be out here. I think the record's 122 years. There's some lady alive right now. So it's going to be a really good opportunity to follow these folks as they get. And I'm going to get older and I'm going to kind of talk about some things that I think would move this line even higher, not only for them but for us. So their job is to keep you flying. And that's John Glenn, I think he was 76 when he flew. I'm also going to end the talk looking at Boston University School of Medicine study of centenarians. Okay, so what of these folks who live past 100, what do they all have in common? Okay, and what do they don't have in common? How did they get there? And that's kind of fun. Uh, this is actually, I can give this to you, and I'm, I'm in the, you know, you guys can email me anytime. I can send you my list of, uh, of, uh, of deals. This is a, a fun thing. This is actually a, a centenarian uh, risk model. You can plug in your social history, your family history, and your medical history, and it'll tell you based on these people how long they think you're going to live. And it's fun to go back in there and play with things like daily flossing will give you six months to three years more life, okay? So, you know, it's up to you. I, I, I try to floss, you know. Now, 
So what I'm trying to do here today is we're, we're kind of, my job, or our job as flight dogs, is mitigating risk through medical screening. Let's not send anybody up that has significant disease, and if they do, then let's get rid of it so they don't. If they had a kidney stone, let's get rid of that stone, and now we think we know how that stone formed, and we think we can prevent it. We think we've gotten smart enough now that we can fly people that have had stones, certain kinds of stones. And so we're, we're doing that. Or let's find coronary disease really early. Let's fix it. Let's reverse it, which you can do now. And let's try to be able to fly those folks. Okay? Or it's so bad, we've got to go cut it out. We've done that too. We found people that you know, had very bad gallbladders and we took them out and we let them fly and those sorts of things. Okay. And we're going to do that through diet, exercise, fatigue, stress management, and medical treatment. All right, here we go. Again, genome plus environment, wellness, longevity. And those are our topics. So let's take each one of them, and I'll tell you, you know, I'll give you an expert that says, I don't care what you do, it's, every, it's what you eat. No, I don't care what you eat, it's your fitness. No, you've got to be able to sleep. It's all of the above, okay? So, and I'm going to do it with public enemy number one. I gave this talk at Safety and Total Health Day to the Astronaut Corps because one of, one of my good friends, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Shaskin uh, over in Russia, one of our flight surgeons basically had a, had a big heart attack and everybody was kind of going, he was supposed to give this talk to the astronaut corps avoiding heat stress and Greg was over in Russia and had a heart attack and could, we didn't get the defibrillator to him in time because he was out running uh, so don't run, no, <laughs> no sorry that was trying, I, I didn't mean to take away from this, but great guy and so I was trying to explain to them what, what, was go what, what happened here and I'm going to try to explain that to you guys as best I know. Uh, bottom line is cardiovascular disease, one in three of us are going to die of it, maybe one out of two of us if we keep going where we're going. And I'll show you that there's no reason for anybody in this room to ever need a stent or ever need bypass surgery. Really. There's no reason. Okay? Unless you're 110 and then you wouldn't want it. No, I'm kidding. So, it's also eating on lunch with expenses and uh, it's, it's not good. And the good news is that new technologies, new understandings of the disease process, and new treatments and countermeasures, you can actually stop and reverse coronary disease. And that's exciting. That's, that's good stuff. And I'm going to use myself because I can talk about myself, not that I want to, but in a bad way to show you all my medical problems and all that stuff. So it'll be fun. I can get away with that and not the astronauts and stuff. So again, there's Norm Thagger, and there's Uncle Phil. I mean, there's Phil Stepaniak. <laughs> Looking good, isn't he? All right. So again, what we eat and breathe, our fuel, exercise, strength, psychological well-being. What do we know about foods? We know that trans fats, which are vegetable oils that have been partially hydrogenated to give them longer shelf life, are not good for you. That they increase our bad cholesterol. Now, there are some naturally occurring trans fats in animal and dairy products. So. If you have a predisposition genetically to those diseases, you probably want to avoid those in moderation or make sure your numbers are right with exercise and other things. I'm not saying you don't eat them. I'm just saying, depending on your genes, and I'll show you mine, you might want to try to avoid those things. I just got back from vacation. I didn't avoid them. It was fun. I've got to lose a little, a little bit of weight now. So, uh, and the other things, uh, uh, saturated fats, again, have a little bit of, I'm going to show you that, like the butter sequence with the Time Magazine, again, saturated fats are not that bad. They just have a lot of calories in them. And if you don't burn those up uh, and you have certain predispositions, they're not going to be good for you. Okay? In fact, circulation, this is a really good review article that's pretty old, 2002, you know, basically said that Mediterranean diet and other diets with diet, you can probably decrease your risk of having a major coronary event by 30% to maybe 50 to 60%. And their recommendations back in 2002, don't smoke, use alcohol in moderation, 30 minutes of exercise, you know, keep your energy balanced, don't eat more than 10% of energy from saturated fats, less than 2% from trans. Trans fats have been outlawed in Europe for about 10 years. They're about to be outlawed. You know, they say no trans fats. They still have a little in there. Uh, they can still have saturated fats if they're just under a certain amount. So you need to just try to avoid those things. Uh, fish is good. We'll talk about that. I'll show you how fish is bad in some ways. Um, 
and uh, eat your veggies. I think that's the biggest thing. Limit salt to six grams. If I eat six grams worth of salt, I'm, I'm sick. I can't do it, okay? It's just too much. But you'd be surprised at just how much salt is in stuff, okay? And you get your taste buds. Our, that's the deal with our kids. Everybody gets hooked on high salt, high fat, high sugar, and, and those things are, are what's killing us, okay? And basically they said back then that if, if you did this diet, and what I'm going to show you, people who do much more stringent than that, you know, you could eliminate coronary disease in, you know, anybody less than 70 years of age. Then the New England Journal article came out with the Mediterranean diet that basically did you monosaturated oil, olive oil and linoleic acid and walnuts and nuts versus go ahead and eat your Mediterranean diet. We don't care what you eat, just kind of eat Mediterranean. And they unblinded it at 4.8 years because 30% of folks who were eating the monosaturated uh, and the nuts were having less uh, coronary disease and cardiovascular events. Um, so that was the first longitudinal well-controlled diet study. And now they're coming out all the time. It's really kind of fun to see what they're learning. I've got a new one I didn't get in this talk, but I'll talk about it. We know that red meat consumption uh, has been associated with type 2 diabetes. We don't know if it's because of this, it's not probably because of the saturated fat, it's just again because of the calories, okay? We know that this study just came out uh, a month ago that people, it's, it's again not, not the red meat consumption, but it's the processed versus unprocessed. Processed has nitrosamines, it has uh, preservatives, it, and, and it has antibiotics, and it's uh, got a huge amount of salt in it for to keep it packed and keep it preserved. Um, the unprocessed organic meats, free range, you know, in moderation, that's fine. No problem there, I don't think. Now, this is, of course, my family, my kid and my wife and myself. We had to go to the Vortex and get the triple coronary bypass burger, which is $28.95. Four meat patties, uh, special sauce, uh, three fried eggs, 14 slices of cheese, 10 slices of bacon, all packaged between two grilled cheese sandwiches. Now, if you just took a bite of that, that would be fine. But who can just take a bite of that, you know? So that's the problem, too much. It's just, give me a break. That's why it's called a vortex and looks like that, but that's in Atlanta, so anyway. What we're finding is a lot of high meat and refined sugar diets are actually changing the gut flora in your, in your gut. There's a different kind of bug that lives in you if, if that happens. Um, sorry, man, call you back. Um, so, that is sort of the new study. You're, they're, they're finding that our gut, our, our biome in our gut is probably the biggest endocrine organ we have in us. There are more critters that live on us than there are us. And so changing that, that uh, making sure that your, your, uh, your gut flora is the right kind is, uh, is probably cuts down on the inflammatory process. I mean, simple diet changes help arthritis. They help change, they, they did one study where they took, you know, gut flora from, from obese people and put it in right mice, they got obese. They put da-da-da and went back and forth. And so they're just starting to study that. And so that is something that, you know, will be um, something that we look at in the future. Glucose. Your glucose, you know, everybody said, I don't care what you eat. I don't care what fats and what meats and all that you eat. Uh, it's all sugar. And it's not all sugar, it's both. If you eat a lot of meat, you're going to have a lot of LDL and a lot of saturated fat. If you eat a lot of sugar, what we're finding is that what the sugar does is make the LDL, the bad cholesterol, low-density lipoprotein, it makes that a tighter, more compact, denser unit. So it's smaller, it's just as dense, it's got just as much bad goo on it, and that can get through your endothelial lining, which I'll show you pictures of, and that can form this immunologic goo that's in your deal. Also, there haven't been a lot of good evidence that you know antioxidants and vitamins and vitamin supplements are that big a help. You know, I take a multivitamin. I take a half one in the morning and a half one at night. That's not going to hurt you, or and it probably will help you. Uh, but what you want to do is get those antioxidants from food. 
Okay, that's because there's so many cofactors we don't know about, and it's hard to pack all those things in one little tablet. Now, the, 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 the thing's not out on supplements and, and cancer, so I'm not saying what you're doing is bad and this and that. I'm just saying that the studies so far haven't shown any real benefit from, from supplements as far as coronary disease go. All right, let's look at the anatomy. This is that single cell endothelial cell lining of your artery. This is your Teflon, okay, of your lining. And that's through every one of our arteries, okay? It's there. And it is cross-sectionally, it is a one cell living, breathing wall, endothelial wall. In fact, this is what gets decimated in Ebola. In fact, they're starting to treat Ebola with statins. Statins lower your cholesterol. They also are an anti-inflammatory properties that probably stabilize this endothelial wall. They've always known that statins decrease the, more, the, the death rates from heart disease uh, a little more than the amount of the, the uh, LDL they drop. And so they think now that it's probably the protection of the endothelial cell wall. Don't know, but that's, that, 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 that's out there. So, and this is the New England Journal of Medicine. This is one of our most prestigious journals. This is in Smith going online and pulling something down, okay, off of, because I get that from certain people. Uh, you know, you've got to have, you've got to have evidence-based medicine. This is not voodoo, and I, I, I hope I'm not getting any of this wrong, but it could be proven wrong later. So be skeptical and ask questions. But what I know is, what I think I know, is that if, it's not just amount, the amount of LDL. The more LDL bad goo you have here, I mean, when you pull blood out of somebody who has a genetic hyperlipidemia with high triglycerides or high LDLs, it turns to wax. If you put your steak in the refrigerator the next day, it's got a waxy goo on it, and that's because that's the fat. Just like when the French flew the French food on Peggy's mission and they opened it up and they thought, We've got fungus among us. You know, it was it was all bad. It was actually just the fat it congealed on it. So that's what's going on in your blood system, and therefore your viscosity of your blood is a little higher. Your aluminum pressure might be higher. Your coagulation factors and your immunologic insults and your inflammatory stressors and chemicals they these could all be affected. And so what happens is this LDL gets underneath this lining, and it's not supposed to be there and forms if you've got an inflammatory process going on uh, from gingivitis, from bad dental disease as you were a kid, which is where I probably got my plaque because I didn't take care of my, my teeth like I should have, uh, or the fact you don't sleep for days and days or that kind of stuff, um, or infections, uh, you form an immunologic goo here, okay? Now the good news is, New England Journal, that with certain foods and certain things such as polyphenols, flavonoids, omegas, three, sevens, nines, resveratrol, thank goodness red wine, okay, that you can actually go in here and break these reactive oxygen species up and transport them out. You can actually remodel some of this what I call goo, okay? And you can also do it with sleep, stress reduction, exercise, and statins. And it's also just not what's going on in your heart. Everybody thinks about your heart. Well, it's also where your blood vessels are the most. They're probably in your brain, okay? And there actually are some data coming out now that are, we're actually starting to make a dent in Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and, uh, but certain people have these little lipoprotein carrier moieties that carry out the amyloid plaques that your brain makes, the waste material of your brain, is carried out by these ApoE uh, lipoproteins. And if you have the ApoE4s, you don't do a very good job of transporting them. So don't get the goo up there in the first place. If you've got the ApoE3s, you do the average amount of carrying. So I'll just, on average, everybody's got a 7.6 chance of having Alzheimer's in this room. If you've got ApoE3s, that's what you've got. If you've got an ApoE4, then you just double that. And if you're homozygous for ApoE, so you got a four and a four, you're now five times that, or your 40% chance of having Alzheimer's, okay? Do you want to know that? I do, okay? Because I want to make 
take uh, precautions to, to avoid it. You've got a 60% chance of not having it. And if you exercise, you now have a 20% chance of having it. And if you eat the right foods, you probably have a 5% chance of having it. So those are the things you can, you can make a difference. So that when you're 95, you're, you're going strong. Okay, so John Belmont, who gave Grand Rounds here a month or so ago, is at the Baylor College of Medicine, and he's our, one of our go-to people. Uh, we're having a genetic screening, well, we're having a Well Woman Summit next Wednesday looking at money's no object, how would you screen people for ovarian cancer, for breast cancer, what would you really do? Would you do really mammographies every year, every no? Would you do mammographies, MRIs, and ultrasounds? You know, what would, we, what would you do if, you, if money was no object? Which is one of the things we get to do here some of the times, sometimes, when we've got such a small group of, of, of folks. And then if we do that long enough and show some benefit, then that we can spread that out to the, to the population. What genetic screening would you do? If you've got BRCA1 and 2 genes and you've got a 65, 75% chance of having breast or ovarian cancer, what would you do? Would you fly that person on space station? Yeah, you would. But you would want to do better surveillance down the road after they left the core, I think. Um, anyway, those are issues we're going to talk about. Well, you could go and for $350, you could go get your 1,300 gene types done. So I did that in 2009 before 23andMe came out and found out, yeah, I got a little higher in increase of Alzheimer's and a little higher increase of coronary disease and statins would work, although I might have a, a problem with uh, muscle pain and myopathy with statins. Uh, or this is probably the best statin for me. Or this is my starting dose of rat poison if I had to get on rat poison, which hopefully nobody will have to. So those are kind of things you can pick up. All right, let's go back to this endothelial cell once again. It not only is a barrier to LDL cholesterol or bad cholesterol, it's also a living tissue that makes nitric oxide, which is a potent vasodilator, okay? That's why arginine, an essential amino acid, that's why you see bodybuilders eating tons of arginine, so they can make a lot of nitric oxide, so they can build their blood vessels, so they can make these giant, funky-looking muscles. And the point is that if you have a lot of oxidative stress, then you don't make nitric oxide. And one of the measures of telling how well you're doing with nitric oxide is how much after you've clamped an artery and you've ultrasounded it and you release it, how much that artery overshoots from normal, how much it dilates. And so you can do tests like that. I did a test on myself. It's used in cardiovascular. We do it here at the lab, which is, you know, you just go over, find Dave Martin, say, hey Dave, let's run a little experiment. So I got up three hours later, I ate my low-fat 300-calorie breakfast, and I got a 12% dilation. Three hours later, I ate my piece of American cheese and piece of bacon, I got my 8%. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but that is a significant amount. I'm saying that if I'd exercised that morning, I probably would have dilated even more. My point being that you, you, you can't get in a rut. You, you gotta, you've got to use all these things at your disposal to, to lead a balanced, day-to-day -day balanced life. And once again, if you can't sleep, can't exercise, then eat the right foods and, and try to make a change the next day. Like I will tonight. Uh, okay, let's look at the coronary arteries. How am I doing? Doing pretty well. Okay, those are the first arteries. Your heart actually pumps blood to itself. So those are the first arteries off your coronary, off the aorta, okay? Right, left coronary artery. And the gold standard, and there you go, okay? There they are. And the gold standard for seeing if you had disease is if you've got blockage. Now, you're not going to see blockage unless you have a 70% lesion, okay? And this is what we thought happened, sort of sludge in the ice machine kind of thing. And then you threw a plaque, and that messed you up. So fortunately, new technologies like boroscopes uh, for looking at cracks and wings, you can actually put an ultrasound probe like you do a cardiac cath in the artery, pull it back, and measure the amount of plaque. So this is an ultrasound probe. These are things from Steve Nissen. Uh, he's the head of cardiology at Cleveland Clinic. One of our consultants. That's the other thing I love about NASA. We get to talk to some really, really sharp people when we need them. 
So this is the ultrasound probe looking straight at you, and that is that endothelial wall lining right there. Okay, that's the artery, and that's a normal looking artery. That's a normal looking artery. Well, that's got a little plaque there. Okay, and you can see it's sort of starting to narrow. So what we thought used to happen is you slowly built up this goo and it clogged it up and you got a heart attack. Or you threw a piece of this and it went downstream, landed at the tip, killed this little piece of tissue here and that upset that piece of tissue and it starts instead of your electrical system going boom, 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 boom. This now starts to fire and take over and you do this. And then your heart does that. The rest of your heart's fine, it's just your electrical system's got out of whack, and that's, that's when you do that. And then hopefully it comes back. We've had a past center director here who has been shocked multiple times and is doing fine now. Uh, so it, it can happen. Um, and the point being that I can show you a few things today that there's no reason for anybody here to rupture a plaque to have that happen. There's no reason. Okay, and here's why. Here's the Glagoff remodeling theory of early atherosclerosis. Remember, you get that little goo forming underneath here. And if you keep doing what you're doing, you keep building this goo out, okay? Well, your artery's fine, except you're building this goo. So here is a cardiac cath with a completely normal artery. And here, it's completely normal. You're doing whatever you're doing, you're great. You've got great coronaries. Well, actually, you've got a big plaque sitting out here, okay? Here, completely normal coronary artery with a completely large plaque sitting here. Just hasn't reached critical mass so that now you have a little segmental lesion. That's about a 20 to 30% lesion. Half the people in this room, probably more than half the people in this room have at least that. In fact, they did with ultrasound, they looked at 30-year-olds, average of 30-year-olds, that ended up being heart transplant donors. Before they transplant them, they did intravascular ultrasound on them. And half the males and half the females had a 30% lesion. Okay, so it's out there. A lot of people, you know, I'll show you Esselstyn, who's at the Cleveland Clinic Wellness Center. You know, he was a trauma surgeon in Vietnam, and that's where he went, holy moly, look at all this plaque that's going on. And when we see it today, you start forming plaque around 9, 11 years of age. Okay? Okay, so. In other words, this thing has to get so big that it's pushing on here before you get the angle of attack showing that you've got an indention, okay? So what's going on is the LDL is getting under here, forming this goo, and then what kills you is if you've got a really bad inflammatory process going, and you can get blood tests to see what your inflammatory levels are. And this thing ruptures, which you won't get if you exercise. You won't get it. And if this thing ruptures and goes, goes south or go, no, goes distal and knocks off that tissue, that's what kills somebody with a clot real fast. If the other thing it does is it forms goo and eventually that goo forms calcium. Well, they develop scanners. You can go spend 200 bucks right now, go down the street, same radiation as a mammography or less, and you can go find out if you've got calcium on your heart. Okay? And that's what we do with our astronauts. And that's yours truly with the Japanese, the Russians, and the Europeans because we had a cosmonaut uh, right before his mission ended up with two stents and had a little heart attack over in the MBL. And whoa, we've got to start screening these guys a little better because once again, a stress test, you've got to have more than a 70% lesion. Okay. So we decided yours truly got on here and got his scan. And so what you see looking down at the heart, this is the aorta, you see a little calcium. You see a lot of calcium. And so for your age, you can find out what your calcium score is. So there's yours truly getting his. And I had pretty bad cholesterols. You know, doctor healed that self. I was about 25, 30 pounds heavier than I am now. Um, wasn't sleeping, was stressing, you know, was working at NASA. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I love this place. And, uh, and so here is my scan, and you see white calcium shows up. That's my spine, that's my sternum, these are my ribs. And this is my heart, these are my lungs, and there's my coronary calcium right there. So I've got a little calcium on my LAD. 
So what I've got is a score of 130. So I'm in the moderate plaque burden. And if you're an astronaut and you're over 100, and we've got three who are over 100, uh, you're dinged. You're done. And then we're going to do a cardiac cath or an angiocath. And if you've got lesions, you were done until recently, until we came up with a, a reversal model and showed that over four years we actually took somebody's uh, triple vessel disease and reversed all of its lesions. Okay? And that person is on flight status. So that's the good news. So here's this. Okay? So this is Smith's super gross simplification model of progression and regression. You know, you, calcium won't kill you. Calcium's fine. You can have calciums of 9, 10,000 and be in your 90s, which people do. It's the plaque, the goo, that builds up that will slowly cause this to pinch in, and that's when they go and put a stent in. But you can get rid of this, and you can reverse it, and I'll show you that. Dr. <coughs> Nissen showed it using medication, diet, and exercise when the LDL was under 80 and the HDL increased by 15%. You increase your HDL by 15% by walking 30 to 40 to 50 minutes a day, five days a week. You get your LDL down by eating the right things or you get on a medication or exercise. And they published this in the New England Journal in 2011 for the first time, although for about 10 years they've been showing reversals that have been going on before this. And again, Steve Niss and Christy Ballantyne's here in town. He's a great guy to go to. Um, show that uh, statins and medications, uh, they saw regression in, in folks. And they saw actually regression using Crestor and Lipitor. That's because pharma could afford to pay for these meds to do these studies and pay for the intravascular ultrasounds. Okay, nobody wants to go and get an ultrasound probe down his coronary artery. So what you can do is, what's the next artery? really close to there. Well, it's your carotids. You can feel them right now, okay? So you can actually go and measure this intima medial thickness of your carotids. We have a machine over in our clinic. We do it everybody that comes in every year, okay? And what we're looking for there are little pieces of plaque or thicknesses that are thicker than they should be, okay? And with an ultrasound probe, and we measure a centimeter's worth of it in the same place. And this is actually software technology. It was developed by NASA. And here is my carotid artery, and here's my carotid intimal thickness in my measurement. On my right side over here, okay? You want it under one millimeter. That's the thickness. So I'm 0 0.7 millimeters, and at the time I was 56. Here's the scale of bad, okay, good. So at 56, I had the artery of a 52-year-old on my right side. Well, hey, cool. I'm all right, doing okay. Then I did my left side. And I've got a 95th percentile, I've got an 80-year-old artery over here, okay? Oops. Now, why is that? Well, because I'm left-handed and because I sleep on my stomach and I've slept all my life with my neck over my arm or my pillow. So a third of my life, I've put, been in hypertensive crisis with my carotid over here, okay? Really interesting. And I actually found papers that show they do that. So. If you do do that, what you want to do is have your pillow sleep on your side and have your pressure on your jaw and not on your neck. Unless you have the genetics that I do. I mean, then you want to do it if you have the genetics I have, which are all the, 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 the stuff that you don't want to have. I got people living to 102. I got people having heart attacks at 62. Okay, so that's okay. I'm all right with that. It's good to know that because I think I'm shooting for the 102. All right. So, Here's the good news, and these are actually astronaut normals. Three years later, my left side has gone from 1.03 to 0.66, and my right side is down to 0.48. So I've reversed these plaques in my neck, okay? So I feel pretty good about that, and that's what you can do, and we can follow that very easily by doing this. Okay, so let's look at some examples of people who say it's all about what you eat and have had some success with, with, with looking at that. So I'll tell you how far you can go one way and how far you can go the other and what's probably the right way to do it. And this is Caldwell Esselstyn. He's pretty, pretty famous now. You can Google him. You can Google Sanjay Gupta's The Last Heart Attack. Um, and he's at Cleveland Clinic. He was a trauma surgeon in Vietnam. He won the gold medal in rowing in 1956. He's a good guy. And uh, he's at Cleveland. And he took people who are friends of his in Cleveland Clinic who basically a small group of folks in 1985 and 88 before statins 
uh, that had distal lesions, like a friend of his who's a thoracic surgeon, who had a distal lesion that was too far to bypass and too, too distal and too long and torturous to stent. So you had to treat them with medicine and diet, okay? And that's what he did. And he put them on a very austere diet and exercise program. And he got a total, this is what all of us should be shooting for in this room, if you know your cholesterol numbers, of less than 150 and you want your LDL under 80, okay? Unless you're one of those people that has an HDL that, you know, like 95 or something like that, which is the good cholesterol, okay? But these are the numbers you want to think about. And I'm happy to chat with you, anybody in this room offline, uh, you just call me over at the clinic, okay? If you want to go over your numbers. And so how did he do it? He did it strictly with grains, legumes, lentils, vegetables, fruits. So complete vegan diet, which is hard to do. But if you do it and get on it and try it for a couple months, you get your set points changed and you find some staples that you really, really like. And you can't eat the salt, you can't eat the sweets, you don't want the fat. I can't eat a salad with salad dressing on it now. I mean, I, I, they bring it to the side or I use balsamic, I can't do it. I don't like it. And so that's how you get your set points changed. So that's a good deal. You know, I use lean meats as a condiment, but I don't, don't, you know, I, I don't eat that because I have these, these genes that are not good. I also have a lipo little aging, which is, um, it's, it's got an extra protein and it, it goes around and it bangs into that endothelial wall and it's not good for you. So you, you treat that with the same thing. You get your numbers right. So his thing is don't eliminate, just get the oil Get the protein, all get it from vegetables, okay? Uh, and avoid these things. Now, why would you avoid fish? Well, because we got a lot of crap out there. Excuse me, we got a lot of mercury out there. We've got a lot of stuff out there. And I'm an example of that. We do a heavy metal profile over here in the clinic. So I can test, check for arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. That's why you have warnings on tuna cans for pregnant women, okay? So yeah. Uh, my mercury level is high, okay? So I gotta watch my fish, I gotta slow down on my fish, okay? So you wanna avoid these things. Now these are people, he used this on people that had disease that were actually having chest pain. Where most people right now, if you have a little instance of chest pain or if you get, say, stand up real fast, you get a little dizzy or you get a little shorter breath and you go to the emergency room and, or you get on a treadmill and you have a little abnormal treadmill and you've got maybe a 70% lesion or a 60% lesion, they're going to put a stent in there or they're going <coughs> to bypass you. And I would say, you don't need that. You can simply reverse it by doing these things. Okay? And that's the new paradigm that's, that's out there. Why is chicken on What? Chicken? What's the they, This is again, because a lot of our fowl is processed, has chemicals in it, and because this is, these are for people. This is one end of the bell-shaped curve of life. This is really strict. These are people who uh, have gotten Clintons on this diet, Bill Clinton. He got bypass surgery and then he had to have, went on ornishes and he had stents and now he's on this. There are people now getting on this diet and, um, and reversing their disease and not having to have surgery. I mean, think about it. If you got cancer and you had to go through chemo, think about what you'd do to do that versus this kills more people than cancer, you know, and you're just going to get on an austere diet. You can just change a few things in your diet to make a big difference, okay? Or you can get on statins. Some people can't handle statins, and there are going to be new medicines out too. But, and then we're not, I'll tell you about exercise too. Here, we're going to get to that. And we're doing okay. Okay, we're doing okay. They said two hours, so that's what I, that's what I prepared. Don't, if you got to go, you got to go. I have no problems with that, everybody. Okay. So again, this is a, these are for people having chest pain that don't want to go have bypass surgery. Yes? Part of your two hours is at the end they're supposed to have the evaluation and stuff, so you really got an hour and a half. Got it, got it. Then I'm rolling, here we go. Okay, so good news is, this is what he did with his patients, with a small group of people, okay, and that's document. His book is really worth reading. I have no financial gain from this. He's just a good guy. He gave a grand rounds here. Uh, well, a couple of our folks ha have been on this diet, I've been on this diet, and you know, we've seen reversals with it. Uh, and it's, it sounds like it's impossible to do. It, you've got to work at it, you've got to cook your own food, uh, you've got to be creative when you go out, but it, 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 it is something that will help you. You'll feel better, your cancer rates will go down, 
You'll, your inflammatory processes go down. Your joint pains will go down. It's the, definitely the thing to do. Okay, so that's some reversal there. Butter, what to eat. This just came out from the American College of Nutrition. This was in the, Con the Chronicle. Chronicle does some good stuff. Let's not forget, it's just not about heart disease. It's also about cancer. And these are things that have been associated. Don't know the cause and effect. Don't know if it's there. But in looking at diets, these are their new recommendations that they've come out with, American Journal of, of uh, Nutrition here, uh, for prostate cancer, dairy products and calcium supplements don't seem to help guys. Alcohol, uh, processed meats, and red meat tend to give you colorectal cancer and EG junction tumor cancer, it's fastest growing cancer we got because everybody's pushing acid up on the esophagus and what's, what do you see every other commercial? It's for you know proton pump inhibitors and and you know and acid blockers and that kind of stuff. Okay, and when you look at the veggies, that puts you all on the other side of the curve. Okay. So what are the recommendations? Avoid dairy products, reduce the risk of prostate. Avoid alcohol, the risk uh, cancers of the mouth, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, colon, rectum, breast. Avoid red and processed meat to reduce the risk of cancers of the colon and rectum. Avoid grilled, fried, boiled meats. Boiled meats to reduce the risk of cancer of the colon, rectum, breast, prostate, kidney, pancreas. Pancreas is starting to etch up because of our obesity. It's starting to take over as the number four cancer we've got. Uh, consumption of soy products to reduce the risk of breast cancer in adults and reduce the risk of recurrence of mortality in women later on. Emphasize, it's eat your fruits and vegetables, just what grandmommy told you. All right, you know, da da da. So, so this is the pyramid for the guy in, at, at Herman Hospital that uh, does the reversal, heart disease reversal. I'll send you that link also. It's all about veggies. Get your protein from veggies. Get your protein and your, and your uh, nutrients from vegetables and fruits. These are fine, just don't eat a lot of them. Eat whole grains if you're gonna eat your breast because they've got the fiber. And some people with celiac who can't handle gluten, a protein in wheat, can't handle it. There's also casein, which are in dairy products. Some people can't handle casein. And then just keep your fats down uh, because they have high calories, but you need fats. That's how you make a, a lot of your uh, estrogen, testosterone are made from cholesterol, so you need those. But you can get it from veggies. Just stay away from the animal processed products. As I've said, looks like saturated fats are not that bad. Just you know, get it so they're not chock full of salt and, and nitrosamines. As Mayo Clinic advertises, as we're doing up in orbit. Look, we're growing cabbages. Isn't that cool? Okay, so eat your veggies. There's Stevie. Exercise strength. Everybody knows if you exercise a lot, if you exercise a little, you live longer than if you don't exercise at all. Period. Everybody knows that. Jack Lane taught us that growing up. Okay. Stephen Blair is somebody we work with and we just published with. <coughs> 30 minutes can change your life. So here's a study. Five minutes. I'm at like 1.5 minutes because I'm doing, I'm talking, my brain, you can burn 30% of your calories with your brain. Uh, Y'all are sitting, you're at one minute. Five minutes is walking briskly. So walking briskly, five minutes for 30 minutes is what we're going to see here now. With a huge amount of patients over a long period of time out of the Cooper Clinic. Uh, and here's what we see. Death rates for females who are sedentary. They die at this rate. Males, like I say, we're a little, we die a little more because we go watch this. Okay. Um, if you walk 30 minutes a day, five days a week, you have or a third your death rate. If you walk an hour or two a day, and the good news on longevity, which just presented at American College of Sports Medicine, is walking four miles and running four miles is the same for longevity's sake. So that's kind of good news, especially when we're getting older and we're banging up our joints or you've got bad joints. When you stop being able to walk 30, 300 yards in a day, you're dead in a year or two, okay? to stat. Okay. It's all this happy news I'm bringing in. You know, it's just, it's just full of happiness and joy. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. It's going it's to be good. So, uh, again, the, the more you exercise, uh, the better you do as far as cancer mortality also. You're flushing the system out. You're keeping things moving. Uh, and the older you get, the more you exercise, the less your death rates are. Okay? At all ages. Okay? Everybody knows that. Now, here's a good one. Here's a really interesting one that, that I like. Uh, I don't care if you're obese, 
I just want you to be fit, okay? Uh, here is somebody who is normal weight and someone who's obese and their death rates if they're fit. And when we say fit, that means they're walking 30 minutes a day, five days a week. If you're skinny or normal weight and you're unfit, your death rate is two to three times than an obese person who's fit. So it's not about carrying that weight around, it's that it's fitness. Although I will show you in centenarians, nobody makes it to 100 who's obese. Okay? So, you know, you got to decide what, where you want to go with this. If you look at statins, highly fit people on statins have a 70% reduction in mortality. Highly fit people, not on statins. Fitness does better than statins. 50% of people have a lower mortality if they're fit. On statins, we'll give you about 30-40% reduction. Uh, okay, this is kind of a cool guy. He's worth going to see his name. I, I'll send you this link to Mike Evans. He's Canadian. He's a really good, really good guy. These, these are really good videos on stress on everything. Uh, what medicine decreases knee arthritis by 47%, dementia by 50%, diabetes by 60%, postpenal osteoporosis 41, anxiety 48, depression 47, Death rates of Harvard alumni, cramps in your leg, hold on, hold on, uh, fatigue, treatment, uh, number one treatment. What would that medicine be? Exercise. <laughs> Kale. That's it, no. Exercise. And that's uh, Stephen Blair. Uh, in fact, if you look at, these are attributable fractions. So this is how all these bad things weigh as far as death rates go. Diabetes and high cholesterol are kind of here. Obesity is kind of here. Smoking is really bad. Hypertension. You know, and hypertension melts away when you lose weight and you go on uh, a plant-based diet. But the most important thing is again uh, fitness. So low fitness. So all you got to do is get out there and go. Uh, we know that fitness is better than stents as far as maintaining patency. That's a big German study that was done. The other thing we found out, they published this study, study in 2008 on muscular strength associated with mortality in men. So muscle strength we always thought it was anaerobic fitness and stuff. And again, Stephen Blair, good guy. And he published this one. Holy moly. Muscle strength, disability, and mortality. We've, little studies from Scandinavia, Scandinavia have been saying the stronger you are, the less you get injured on the job, and the less you die. Well, um, what have we been doing on our astronauts since 1985? We've been doing isokinetic testing on them. We've got this incredible database of knee, shoulder, and back isokinetic testing. Okay? And that's what we do. Here's Peggy, two days after she comes back from being on the space station for six months. We're on an isokinetic machine. Isokinetic machine means no matter how strong you are, it's going to go at 60 degrees per second, back and forth, no matter if, whether it's me or Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay? And you develop these torque curves. And there's my torque curve on my left knee. And that's what we use to see objectively when an astronaut comes back to its pre-flight standard of after being up in space. Well, there are companies out there, there are a couple of companies, who actually use isokinetics uh, to, to measure knee, shoulder, back strength and tell you whether or not you should be a baggage handler at United, okay? And when I was in Ohio training, I got to know these folks and I've been interested in, in working with them because we did isokinetics here on, on uh, looking at, on preventing injuries and now mortality. So they got three muscle groups here and uh, um, they do knee, shoulder, back, just like we have isokinetic machines over in our gym. It would be real simple to do this on our folks. Every person who's come in as an astronaut on selection has had their knee, shoulder, back done. Um, and they put this into a single score and they compared it against the different Department of Labor standards, sedentary, light, medium, heavy, very heavy, and they tell you what, whether or not you should be a baggage handler or not. And they decrease injury rates. It's not rocket science. The stronger you are, the less injured you get. 85% of your injuries are caused by 15% of your people that are too weak or have bad joints. So this screens those folks out. This came out, and I called up uh, the guy I knew who ran one of these companies. I said, do you have informed consent? Do you, yeah. Do you, to follow folks for injuries and death? Yes. Do you have social security numbers? Yes. So I went to the IRB and said, we'll plug in about five or 6,000 of these folks, go online with their social security numbers, see if they're dead or not. And then if you pay $6 more, you can find out what they died of. I didn't have $6 more, so we didn't do that. But these are really wimpy people. These are really strong people. 
And so what do we get? We crunch the numbers here, alphavacin. And so if you're really strong, you're dead here. And if you're really weak, you're dead here 10 years later. And that's pretty cool. And so we did it with females. We didn't have the spread. We didn't get statistical significance on the Cox evaluation, the, Mark, the, the, the Kaplan analysis we did. But we, we got trends and very nice trends. So this, let's look at me. This is me. I went and took this test. This is my knee, this is my shoulder, this is my back. Now, for some reason, my left leg here and here is really strong. And for some reason, my left arm is decently strong. For some reason, my right arm is pathetically weak. And for some reason, my core, which most people's core, is pathetically weak. Okay? So this is not good. So unfortunately, if I went to United Airlines and tried to be a baggage handler, I didn't make a cut. They would say back then, go and work out a little bit, come back. So I did. I went and trained doing sit-ups, push-ups, pull-ups, and I got my score up, so now I could be a baggage handler at United Airlines. <laughs> but the cool thing about this is if you put this in a mortality deal, I now have an 18% association with a 20% a increase in 10-year survival just by increasing that. So that would be a really fun thing to do with measuring our astronauts as they come back, retire, is to see what their evolution of their muscle strength has been and to see what, how that correlates with all the other different parameters we have on them, which would be really kind of cool. And we published this in American College, presented at American College of Sport Medicine, Be Stronger, Live Longer, and talked to you about that. So, and even China, you know, our kids are just not, this has been, this is a Swedish study looking at a million adolescents and showed that if they were strong as kids, they had a 20 to 35% uh, decreased chance of having a premature death. Uh, even China's fitness is down. So fitness is the key. We gotta, and it doesn't take much. It really doesn't, I mean, if you just simply work standing up, that's 50 more calories an hour right there. So things like that, walking around, doing things. We're putting in a program at Mission Control to actually have them walk when the ZOEs come in and they're off center and they got to walk around that wakes them up and we give them a big boast of blue light. We've also had astronauts that we've done cardiac casts on and four years later we've proven that they've reversed their disease and that's exciting and been able to qualify them. All right, finally, I got 10 minutes to get through this. This is not going to work. All right, I'll be real quick with this, okay? And this is fatigue training, you know, sleep and fatigue. You've been interested in this because that's what happens all the time. I made the front of sleep review, big deal. All right, Light is Medicine uh, presented at the Sleep 2014, which is, it is. And that's the, the, the newest, coolest thing that's going on is light can be physiologic. Like right now, we're on the space station. We're getting about 130 lux or 40 lux of light. It's not good. And if you're on space station and you're not going to the cupola and getting 100,000 lux, and you definitely don't want to go to the cupola right before you go to bed or you won't go to bed, okay? And so what we're trying to do is actually outfit the station and outfit rooms, that's where we're going. So you're actually getting the same sunlight, although it can, it'll look brighter than this, but you'll get the same sunlight as you're, if you were outside, okay? And we'll talk about that. So it's controlling the light. And of course with shuttle, with a sunrise and sunset every 45 minutes and you know, people looking out the window and hanging out doing spacewalks, you know, sleep can sometimes be really tough and interesting to do. What we deal with in medicine, I have to deal with all these medical conditions that give you insomnia. Poor sleep hygiene, what we're dealing with is a lousy sleep environment and uh, circadian dyssynchrony, flying to Russia, flying to Japan. And we know that when you don't sleep, your brain looks like you're on alcohol. It's a matter of acute fatigue. So I'm doing pretty well right now because uh, I have acute fatigue now because I haven't slept well. I'm doing better because the last week I got a lot of good sleep because I was on vacation, uh, although I was under stress because of family issues uh, with a sister. Uh, and circadian, this is a good time of day, except I'm in these fluorescent lights. If I was outside, I'd be a lot more alert. Da da da, a lot of people have it. People don't tell their physicians when they show up. I have sleep problems. They wait till they get hypertension, congestive heart failure, depression, anxiety. Um, you know, even people with severe sleep apnea, which means you have to wake up while you're sleeping because you're not breathing for 10 seconds and you have to wake up more than 30 times a night or seven times an hour, you uh, totally obliterate your, your sleep architecture. That's why with a head cold, you can be in bed for eight hours, wake up, 
and you feel like I didn't get any sleep. I didn't get any sleep. Uh, that's I have that happen because of my wife's cats. All right. So <laughs> stress, stress feeds stress. Insomnia, they feed on each other, and that's what gives you problems. You need sleep. Uh, you need seven to nine hours of it at least. Uh, it's where you defrag your computer, you consolidate your memories, and you basically drain your brain at night. That's the latest thing that's come out. That you've actually got lymphatics in your brain. The interstitium of the framework architecture of your brain increases by 15% while you're sleeping, and that's when you drain your brain. And that's why I need to go drain my brain more. All right, there's some really funky models out there with fish and birds. This, these animals, when you're, like right now, my brain is desynchronized because the back here is looking at you guys, so it's firing. I'm smelling stuff, I'm talking. So my whole brain is going, and that's what desynchronized looks like here. When you're in deep delta wave sleep, sleeping, then your whole brain is kind of synced up, flowing, okay? Well, dolphins can have half their brain full up and half of it full of sleep, and then they can switch off. We can't do that, unfortunately. Although some people try it with cell phones, but it doesn't work. So this is your sleep architecture, trying to get to this low, deep sleep right in here. This, and it's not very much of it in the middle of the night. And then you try to get the REM sleep, which is your dream, and that's where you're working out the psychological issues. Well, if you have trouble getting to sleep, if you wake up in the middle of the night, brief arousals, you, you're in bed for eight hours, you feel horrible. So this people might have restless leg or they might have sleep apnea. And what we have, we have people flying to Moscow, to Cologne, to Japan, kind of hanging out. They're not just hanging out, you know. <laughs> they're doing stuff. And we, these are our ship workers at Mission Control. And what you're trying to do here is, uh, this is Houston time. This would go to Baikonur and spend two weeks, get well adjusted, and then you launch. And, and then, you, then you've got to take a power nap here and then you launch, and then you're on the Soyuz, and then you dock. Or you launch here, right when you shouldn't be launching, you launch, but we do anyway. You gotta take a power nap here, and you dock six hours later, okay? Or you're doing this kind of stuff in orbit. So this is when, um, this is when it's hard to sleep. And this is, uh, I'll give you an example. And this is an entire, this is Peggy's entire mission while we had uh, different operations. This is six months in space when, when she was supposed to be sleeping. And you can tell when docked ops, and we're gonna have this now, when we get our new crafts up there, this is gonna come back to haunt us. Uh, doing spacewalks, the shuttle docks, and you slam shift these people all over the place. And with ActiWatch data, you find out that over the last two months of being up there, she's sleeping about four to five hours a night. And that's why she was free ranging with naps and needing to use a lot of medications. Um, yeah, okay. And so, what do we learn from shuttle? Hygiene, sleep hygiene, um, is very, very important. And being, keeping, I got too much here to do. Um, can I get 10 more minutes? I'll, I'll mail the surveys out to the people. Okay. They have to sign, so that sheet is floating around. Yeah. Because you want to get credit if your name is signed on that list. Well, this is the first, per, first personal hygiene kit for the for SDS-1, John Glenn's mission. And these are what I carry with me in my bag, because if you travel, you've got to get good earplugs, and you've got to get, you got to get rid of the sun. You've got to get rid of light. And this is what we did in 1991 on... STS-35, we started using lights to help shift folks in orbit before they'd launch on the shuttle. And that's Chuck Sizer. Use them to shift there. What light does, light keeps you from making melatonin. Okay? So if we were outside right now, melatonin, our sleep hormone, would, it would be depressed. You wouldn't be making any. Okay? So about 8 o'clock at night, you start to make melatonin. I'll show you those slides. And so what happens? You drop your core body temperature about a degree. That's why you want it cool at night. Uh, your melatonin goes up. Your cortisol, your stress hormone goes down. Then it starts to go up when you start to wake up. That's when most people have their heart attacks in here. Your growth hormone goes up, and that's where you repair all, the, all your muscles you've, you've kind of messed with from working out the day before, and you repair your neurotransmitters in your brain. And that's why it is so key that these little guys you know, my two boys, I mean, if they didn't get their sleep in, in middle school, I mean, they were just different little creatures. And that's why we need to let them 
sleep later, but that's a whole other story. Uh, shift workers, I mean, if you don't sleep, get enough sleep, you get more colds, you get more heart disease. Uh, shift workers get at least five to seven hours less sleep a week. They have all of these problems, and who gets them? They're not, they're not uh, healthcare workers and emergency workers. They're 24-hour shift workers in factories. And who gets the most sleep? The flight crews, because we mandate it. Six and a half hours. Truckers, four. That's why we see a lot of this. Okay. All this thing happen. All these things happen. Your cancer rates go up. Um, I'm not going there. And we're the worst, docs. If you are, uh, if you do every third night on call up, you make 5.6 times more errors. This is Laura Barger, just uh, who came out with the stuff on us. Um, you have more needle sticks. One in five interns admitted making a fatal mistake, uh, a fatigue-related mistake that caused serious injury, and one in 20 said they led to a death. Been there. Accidents. Uh, you have uh, one of our uh, Capcoms fell asleep and put the car in their front yard, and that caused us to get on top of things with mission control. Skipper, I'm good to go, just a little tired. Skipper, I'm good to go, just a little drunk. You're not going to let a guy fly. Well, if you've been working 20, 23 hours straight, you're legally intoxicated. Uh, as far as your performance. See how they go down here and then they start to get better. Why is that? That's because of their sleep shift. Their circadian rhythm's kicking in. It's like this morning, even though I got like three or four hours sleep last night, I'm feeling pretty good right now. I'm kicking in. If I kept doing that, you keep getting worse and worse and worse. All right, another exciting thing. Light just doesn't suppress melatonin. It also hits the back of your retinal ganglia and makes this thing called melanopsin, which is an alertness pigment, okay? which alerts you, and it's hotwired to your suprachiasmic nucleus, which is the pacemaker of your body. Each of your cells has its own intrinsic, and each of your organ systems has its own kind of circadian rhythm. You know you've shifted when your gut is back in line, when you go to Europe or you go to Japan. When you start going to the bathroom at the same time, that, then you know you're, you're shifting, you're feeling better. Um, well, here's a spectrum of light. Here's a normal spectrum of light. This is the normal spectrum. This is, if you were outside right now, this is what your back of your retina would be seeing. This is what we're seeing right now, and this is what we see on Space Station. This is what they were going to give us on station with our new LED lights, and we talked them into this, and I'm going to tell you what else we did. Uh, so, this spectrum of light is the most powerful suppressor of melatonin and the most powerful maker of melanopsin. So, this is light in a box. And now with LEDs, you know, if you plug it in, you know, this, that's like being out in sunlight right now. Okay, so use this about 10 or 15 minutes an hour, that's like being outside. If you have it, if you, we know that if you get sunlight outside, you're going to sleep better at night. If you exercise, you're going to sleep better at night. Okay? So, um, so now you can carry the sun in a box with you for eighty nine ninety five. No, okay. Huh? No. Now it's UV, and that's the spectrum. That's a good question. This is UV lights down here, and in fact, if you start to get into here, you can you can start to get a little damage. So th these are these are safe frequencies right here. But the cool thing, here's the deal. That's how we use light to help shift you much more efficiently. Like we can shift you going to Moscow. You give me two days before you leave and I'll get you there in a day or two. I mean, we can shift you three to five times faster. And here's what's happening. Here is eight o'clock and here's the normal melatonin curve. Okay? Like this and bang. So if we give you blue light, like you get to Moscow and you're really tired and it's five in the afternoon and we turn this light on and your system wants to make this melatonin, we'll suppress it down here and then we'll turn the light off and bang, you'll be able to go to sleep. And we'll shift that curve a lot faster. So we can use light and darkness to help shift curves. We can also use melatonin, strategically placed, and we can also get smart people from Brigham, like Steve Lockley, to put that into a chart to help you shift when you go to Moscow. <coughs> and we did this with our international partners and developed a, a management guidelines and came up with an entire implementation program where we give an education session and then I'll sit down if any of you guys want to go to Tokyo or you want to go to you know it's going to cost you a bottle of wine. No. If you if you if you want come over to the clinic 
and I'll give you one of my old steals and I'll sit down with you and we'll sit down and do a comprehensive assessment and then but I'll ask you to follow up with me to see how you did smart people and we came up with this clinical practice guideline which has been implemented and we need to carry it on uh, and da da da. Now the other thing is hypnotics and very quickly on hypnotics and we're almost there uh, the only time you want to take a hypnotic is when you've got to sleep you have a window of opportunity to sleep and you don't feel like sleeping. Smith, you've got to go work Orbit 1 tonight. You've got to go work Michigan Control at 11 o'clock tonight. Alright, I'd say see y'all, bye. Go to my house, get it real cold, put my goggles on, lock the cats in another part of the house, you know, and I take either 5 of Ambien or 10 or 20 of Zalplon and I go to sleep it's, uh, and I would sleep till 10, I'd wake up, drink some coffee and I'd go in and I'd work all night. And every so often, I'd give myself some blue light that night to keep me alert and I'd stand up and walk around. And we just did that in Mission Control and it works really well. So that's when you use a sleeper for us. You get to France and you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't sleep, go ahead and take a small dose of a sleeper, okay? To, so to sleep in times like when you're, you're just, you, you know, you're going to perform better if you get that sleep. Like here, uh, wake up got to take a nap here, stay up all night and launch in a Soyuz. Okay, well launching on a Soyuz will wake you up, I would think. But this is when you would take a nap with a short-acting sleeper. And we have really good sleepers that have very, very short half-lives that are out of your system like that. And the good news is, our problem is, not only do I have to have a sleeper that's efficacious that gets you to sleep, but I'm going to have a sleeper if I give it to an astronaut and an alarm goes off, which happened a few weeks ago when they had the captain smell and stuff, and they woke them up, they didn't see anything, and they went back to bed, and I'm sure one of them probably took a sleeping pill, and then the alarm went off. So I've got to have the right dose at the right person so that they can wake up and function. So here's Smith's gross simplification model of sleep induction. There is some level where these medicines, this is Alplon and this is Ambien, this is Sonata and Ambien, the ones we use the most, that give you sleep, and this is an area where there's impairment. Okay? And what we don't, what we want is a medicine to help get you to sleep. But then if you have to wake up and perform, you're going to be okay. And so do the ground testing, and over the last four years, we've done that. We've developed this program in astronaut crew quarters where we do a battery of tests on them pre flight. We did it, of course, with guinea pig flight surgeons, which we published and presented at ASMO a while back. And so we, we illustrate, we mock up the space station, give them a placebo or give them a, a medication <coughs> and for a group of folks of seven that we did this was the performance decrement on uh, a 10 milligram which is a lot of ambient versus placebo. It took them three times longer. Okay, So that's okay, that's what the team did but this individual did fine so I'm feeling good about that. I feel good about this guy or gal being able to perform on that amount of med which is what I did with one of my crew members that go up and that's what we've been doing. This person, no, you need to take five or you need to take a different shorter acting medicine like Zalplon. Um, and then finally sleep training, we've developed, Ron Mumau who gives a talk on sleep here, it's really good, developed a thing called cognitive behavioral therapy and progressively relaxation therapy. It's called sleep training, we've been using it with our astronauts. It's six two hour sessions now we've got it down to about two one-hour sessions with astronauts. Remember those hemispheres. Well, we've got two hemispheres too. We just can't do three complex tasks at the same time. So why is it that we can't, when we wake up in the middle of the night and you've got a talk to give or you've got sister you've got to take to MD Anderson or you've got something going on, you know, and you can't sleep. That's because you've got racing thoughts, okay, or you've got to do a spacewalk. Okay, so the way you get through that is you you train one of your hemispheres to, to relax and meditate in a state and you take one hemisphere and you visualize something and the other hemisphere you contemplate something. Counting sheep, simple illustration. If you're thinking racing thoughts, you've got to think of the sheep here you're, and then you you got to count them here. That gets rid of the racing thoughts. And if you've done that, the counting sheep part where you're really relaxed and almost in a sleep state, it's called state dependent learning you can put yourself out in a dentist chair just like that and that helps. We've done that with some of our astronauts. It's worked really well. And then finally, I'm going to skip through all this and take you to the fun stuff with Space Station. What we're going to do with our LED lights is actually be able to control the light to give you blue or red or no blue. 
So, and we're going to have to do that because when we go to Mars, you're having to stay up every day 38 minutes later, which we did with the Mars Lander program. So we're replacing all these lights now with LED lights at the crew quarters. And of course, we got the standards wrong. We shouldn't have had these different colors, but we got it right. So this will be, this will be new phase with a lot of blue light, so that'll wake them up. This will be the general illumination during the day. And then this will be the pre-light, pre-night, with no blue in it. It's got no blue wavelength. And that's what you should have before you go to bed. That's why you want to stay away from your computers. Go to flux.com and you can download a program which will take the blue light out of your screen starting about 8 o'clock at night. And it's really pretty cool. And we got some good press in Scientific America on that. And I'm not going to go in the little Zio stuff because they went out of business. We just don't want this to happen. What's wrong with that picture? His shoes are on the wrong feet. <laughs> that could have been a big deal. Okay, and we're doing it with our flight controllers. Uh, we're fixing mission control. We've got some real success stories there with those. Got some good press in New York Times. And I'm not going to tell you about commercialized medicine. You all know that transhab is kind of fun. It's interesting stuff out there. We need to go by Mars. They're taking pictures of us. We found water on Mars. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. You know, you learn from building, up, building a geodesic dome. So we need to go back to the moon. You learn that if you build a, put a frisbee on a beach and you come back every year, you're going to dig, be digging yourself out, which is what we do, and that's why the South Pole now is on stilts and can go up and down. And what we need to breed now. Let's go back to this, and we're ending. The other cool thing that we're going to do with the Kelly brothers, there's these things on the ends of chromosomes called telomeres, on the tips of your chromosomes out here, and they only shorten. And now you can assay them for about 85 bucks. <coughs> Won the Nobel Prize in 2009 on this. So we're going to start doing that. We know in animals and in humans, athletes who exercise uh, a decent amount, and after about two hours of exercise, you're really probably doing yourself more harm than good, uh, that the telomeres shorten at a slower rate. Okay? And so not only can we test and see how much DNA damage you've had, but now we can see how much of your life force of your cells' DNA is actually burned up and how well you aged over that year. And we're going to do that on the Kelly brothers, and that's Susan Bailey, Colorado State, we're working with on that. Finally, centenarians, last three slides. What do they have in common? Centenarians, not all centenarians are alike. They vary widely in years of education, socioeconomic status, religion, you know, super religious, super atheist, patterns of diet, strictly vegetarian to extremely rich in saturated fats. Okay? But what do they all have in common? Nobody's fat, especially in men, obese. Nobody has a substantial smoking history. Remember, you know, 30% of people get uh, lung cancer never smoke. Okay, so our environment is important, what we breathe. Centenarians are able to handle stress. Okay, and so if you can't handle stress well or you don't handle it well, there are tons of techniques out there to go and figure out how to handle stress. You know, 10% of the stress, I mean, it's how we... 90% 90% of the stress is how we have actually view the information we got and react on it versus thinking about it and exercise is probably the number one thing to help you with stress. The other neat thing is 15% of people who make it to 100 don't have any demonstrable disease. 43% at the age of 80 get their disease, you know, have disease after 80 they make it to 100, like hypertension or something like that. 42 or arthritis or something. 42 before 80 and they make it to 100. So instead of the older you get, the sicker you get, it's, it's more the older you get, the healthier you've been. So take care, don't eat the yellow snow, take time to look out the window, get the light, get out and exercise, you know, play your guitar with uh, Dan on orbit and James Taylor in the corner up there in the Mipser and party and rock with James and questions and comments and only in Texas. I love it here. And that's my email here and this is no longer valid. That's it. Thank you. Well, I got five seconds. Thank you all. Um, that was excellent. It was Thank very you. informative. And the little known facts that I had. So you went through the stuff earlier about your uh, credentials and where you went to school and all of that. Have you got a parking ticket on me up there? Oh, no. <laughs> How many people do? No, I'm not, I won't even tell that part. 
But how many people knew that uh, Dr. Johnston won the Bob Hope Talent Show? <laughs> oh. You are. Yeah. Don't you get that, that girl? girl. Okay. And I play guitar. I had a really talented partner. He was really good. Yeah. And that he is a oh, you pull a that musician. He's a singer, a songwriter. Oh. He like he plays the piano. He plays the guitar, and he claims to have written "Fly Me to the Moon." No. <laughs> okay. We're cutting you off now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he claims that. But uh, I wanted you all, everybody, uh, in order to get the, the credit for the class, since I'm now Helen Lane and uh, I've taken over, I'm Jan Hall, Rocky. and I have taken over as the Human System Academy lead, and my secretary, who is Lucia uh, Guerrero, is, uh, Guerra, is the um, person who will physically be putting your information into the system, and she will be sending you the um, oh well we got time if they want to stay we've got the the uh, surveys if you're willing to fill them out and if you're not we'll send that off to you but I really would like if you all would, would fill that out and, and uh, leave them here with us and our next lecture is uh, September 30th and it's the human risk of space flight and it's Jen Fogarty Oh, cool. And she'll be doing that on uh, September 30th. And Ruby is the person who has everybody's uh, records. And so bottom line, if you want to know how close am I to getting my ROI, she has gone through exhaustively now and can tell you where you stand as far as your required classes, where you stand as far as your uh, elective classes, where you stand as far as the um, tours. So everybody, in order to get the ROI, is required to do five required classes, nine uh, electives, and two of the uh, two, of, two of the tours. And so, bottom line, we we lined up between now and November. I just gave you the thing for September, but we lined up two tours that we're, we're going to post all of this on the Human System Academy calendar. So you can see where it is, and I hope you all will join us. And um, you're welcome to come to all of these. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. When I contacted him, he very graciously agreed to to do this. And so I appreciate you. It's fun. Yeah. Good. And we thank. You. Do you have any questions? Yes, I, I have two questions. One is regarding the uh, gene test. Yeah. Is there a way to do that anonymously? Uh, you can, that's a good question. In fact, let me just go online here. I was preparing to do that. This is, you go online, you Google 23andMe, and this is a spinoff from one of the uh, owners of uh, Google. Um, and uh, it's, you can go and do the kit, and they will give you your ancestry stuff. Like, let me uh, just, I'm online here, let me... Let's see, and it says that, so let me sign in, and it, I go to 23andMe again, I have no financial connections with these folks. It's just, I've talked to their medical director, their lead, and it tells you, you know, your ancestry, tells you how much Neanderthal you've got in you, you know, I've got a little more than I should, but actually that's good, I was hanging out with wild and crazy people that could get across the ice, you know. <laughs> but it tells you your health risks, and you can go there and it tells you your strengths, your weaknesses, and I've already told you mine. But uh, you're not going to get this until the FDA unbridles it. So I don't have the BRCA's, which if you have a BRCA in your mail, you have higher risk of prostate. I do have this Alzheimer's risk that I mentioned to you. I have a little higher colorectal cancer risk than the 5.6. You can go and look at all the traits that you have some mild elevations in. You know, like, it, what does it mean to have, you know, the normal is 1.6% for Parkinson's, I'm 1.9. You know, nobody knows what that means. The Alzheimer's and the and the colorectal that makes means instead of every ten years I'm going to get my colonoscopy every eight years, or I'm going to be more careful about it. I'm going to eat my veggies and and I can prevent most of this stuff. Basal cells a little higher. I have had one taken off. I go see my dermatologist. So you can go on, and then it has decreased risk. You know, diabetes. I should get diabetes if I do. That. Melanomas are low, <coughs> are lower, uh, and you get to find out. You know, really. Oh, you get to find out really fun stuff like uh, your health traits 
like you know if you have uh, you know what your typical risks are for AFib, for coronary disease, uh, bipolar disorder. I'm doing okay there, although I'm a little bipolar. And uh, you know you can also, if you want, you can find out who your relatives are and, and share information. Uh, so you can right now the FDA is making them, uh, and, and let me just go into one of them and show you. Like here's Alzheimer. It's it's really good and it tells you it's got a video on it tells you what want to know or don't want to know. You don't have to find out if you've got it. You know, it tells the average risk. It does, does the thing on the APOE gene types. It tells you what you can do to fix it. You know, definitely I don't want to be playing football like I did as a kid. You know, or repeated head trauma, uh, being knocked unconscious for more than 30 minutes is not good. Family history, I don't have a family history for it. Eat the right foods, plant-based diet, play, stay Stay busy, and then it gives you the citations. It gives you what they're basing all this information on, which is simply regression on amine analysis of a phenotype associated with the genes, and um, and and so you can go read all these things here, and then they constantly are updating it. And the more people that do this, that actually put in their information, uh, then the bigger the pot, and the bigger they can figure out. Like I have every female on my mother's side of the family has, has had breast cancer, okay? Mm. And they're all BRCA1 and 2 negative. So there's another gene out there. And so that's how by having, you know, it was very expensive to do these gene tests. And now it's not. And so the more people that can do that, the more information we get. Uh, and as soon as we get legislation that protects you from, from you know, the insurance companies from it, um, uh, I think the better off we'll all be, the, the more informed. No, you don't, no, they have, they have firewalls and all that, just don't know if they get hacked. Yeah, but, you know, we don't, we don't know. So, it, it's actually, they, they do a good job. So you could just go to 23andMe, Google it, and for $99, if you can go to, you can go to Belmont, and it's uh, to the genome group and get a gene chip for 350 at Baylor. Just go Baylor Genomics Department and gene chip. And, or I can get John Belmont to let me know. And you can get all this information. I, I would go on and do this, and I would, it's fascinating what you'll find out. And then as far as the genetic information, as soon as they jump through the hurdles of the FDA, I think that'll be available to you probably a month or a year, something like you that. You got another question? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, early on, you were talking about insomnia fatigue, and two numbers, four and a half versus six hours. Whether it was misaligned or aligned? Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah, great question. That's uh, when you're misaligned, that's when you're doing those doc dops. In other words, the, the times when where they got into real trouble is we always um, we always protected the shuttle crew because they had to go up there and you know it's it's just nonstop and it's and it's uh, and it's spacewalks and that kind of stuff. So um, so what we would do is we could we could shift them on the ground very effectively, um, and it was harder because we didn't have the lights and all to shift people in orbit, like the folks. So uh, when you are, come on now, where is it? That makes sense to me. Yeah. So it's misaligned is when you've got dock dots, shuttles coming up, and uh, and and you're slamming the crew on orbit. Uh, to meet up with them and to do the spacewalks with them. And uh, that's where we got into trouble. Now remember, the other thing that we could have done on that mission is they're descending and ascending shuttle landings into Kennedy. And that makes a big difference. If we'd uh, shifted Peggy's stuff, we wouldn't have had that problem. Why can't I? Oh, here it is. Yeah. So what we should have done here is this was for a, 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 a ascending landing into Kennedy this way. If you go over the country, which we don't like, didn't like to do after Columbia, but if you came in descending, then this shift, they would have gone this way. So we would have slammed them here, and then they would have shifted later and later and then synced up. What we did here was slam them to here, and right about here they're doing okay, and then here they're starting to decompensate, and then we slammed them back, and they're just and then we packed in this two weeks with scheduling. So that's just the way it works. 
And that's when, that's when you, you need to use meds and you need to have timeouts. You know, you need to just say, and we did that on, on my laundration missions. We had a couple instances we just said, stop. You gotta stop, we're gonna stop, stop, okay? And that worked. But it's being able to say that sometimes, it's kind of hard. I, I have an additional question. Uh, you talked about veggies, but did you, do you include starches when you say veggies? No, what, what I'm saying with ve complex carbohydrates, you know, there's carbohydrates, which are, we get, which are simple sugars, okay? And those are breads and, and potato chips and those sorts of things. Uh, they're, they're simple sugars. They're just sugar. I mean, there's nothing different in a, in a piece of white bread than go ahead and giving you a little sugar. There's no, except they've added some nutrients to it. There's, it you need fiber. What, what sugar does is if you've given a bolus of you know, simple sugars, it's going to quickly raise your blood glucose level. You know, your sugar level is going to go up, and then you make insulin, and then you, you're living like this, and that drive, the insulin goes up, and then your sugar dies. You know, it's better to eat a lot of little meals, eat complex carbohydrates. The whole glycemic index is a is a is a is a is a, is a, uh, a meal or a, uh, a a a protein, a little bit of fat, a little bit of protein, a little bit of or or, or complex carbo, which is, all right, I'm sorry, a complex carbo is something that's going to feed into your system slower like a piece of broccoli, okay, has got fat in it. A tomato has 6%, 8% fat. You can squeeze a tomato and that's what I cook with, okay? Or I, I use diced tomatoes and that's my oil. So there's fat, it's vegetable oil, okay? It's just natural, it's, it's there and it's like orange juice. Orange juice is about as bad as a Coca-Cola unless you're getting the pulp and the, the rest of the orange with it. Because you're getting 120, you know, calories worth of pretty good sugar. Okay, that's why we give orange juice to people who have taken too much insulin and they've dropped their sugar so low. Okay, because it's rapidly absorbed. It's the quick bolus of sugar. Whereas if you eat the orange, you're going to get the same amount of sugar, but you're also going to get fiber and protein and even a teeny bit of fat in that. And so that feeds into your system slower. So you're living more like this instead of doing this. Okay. So when I say comp complex carbos are vegetables that have proteins, fats, and sugars in them, but they feed, they just feed better. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. I keep seeing headlines about sedentary lifestyles or supposedly sitting at their desk all day. And they keep calling that the new heart disease and whatnot. And that even exercising for 30 minutes a day after sitting at your desk for eight hours isn't going to offset the damage that you do. What are your I, I think, on? well, the, the data here with the, the Cooper Clinic stuff was, uh, you know, if you just get off your duff 30, 30 minutes a day and walk at a brisk pace that does negate some of the, the factors and if you're you know I mean, you're gonna make a smart desk where you can sit there and do stuff I mean, it, it's fine calories are calories you know if, if you if somebody went and ate at McDonald's and they did fine but they just ate little pieces you know you, when you fat has twice the, almost twice the amount of calories in it or a gram of fat it's nine calories per gram as a sugar with a gram you know is is four calories. Protein is four calories. Um, so it's it's uh, if you look at the glycemic index, you know, for diabetics, those are foods that are relatively slow metabolizing that don't give you boluses of sugar. How did I get back on that when you asked me about exercise? I I, I think uh, it, you know it's the key. It's moderation. If 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 you're it's worse for your back and. Your, butt and your posture and everything else if you're sitting at your desk all day. It's just not good. You just have to get up and walk around every so often. You know, we're not programmed. We didn't evolve to be, although we are, you know, to be, you know, couch potatoes. You need to be outside. And that's the next thing that's going to happen with your lights. You can now buy LED lights. It costs a buck a year in power. It costs $69 right now. They'll go down in price. 
You can buy LED lights that have one twenty-fifth of the power rating of these puppies. Well, not, not fluorescence, but of the can candescence. That you are now going to be able to control the amount of blue frequency, red frequency. So your room, you can pro program your house to be a day-night cycle. And actually, you can control the hue of it so that it's not as bright looking, but you're still getting blue out of it. Although that's harder to do. So in other words, you'll get a physiologic day. If you get more sunlight, if like I, I work at a window, I'm getting good sunlight. But we also look at what we've done with our schools and our engineering down here, especially. We've engineered things with low ceilings and windows far out because AC is so important. Power is so important. So <coughs> you're not getting the light in. And so now we can fix that with LED lights. <coughs> Control that. So that, that's the kind of fun thing. I mean, go to Verizon right now. You can buy Philips, little Philips lights that you can program with your iPhone and turn different colors. The next step is they're coming out is to be able to program uh, lights that give you physiologic blue and no blue and red and plant growth, which gives you a lot of blue and a lot of red. Okay? So they grow plants better. I hear they're big in Colorado. And <laughs> Good question. Keep it up. I was just wondering, when you're talking about the light in the melatonin, what about blind people? How does the light affect their, their physiological? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. In fact, they just uh, came out with a, uh, Steve Lockley um, is coming out with a, a melatonin. They come out with a melatonin preparation. You just take oral melatonin, that helps them. Uh, that you don't have light sensors on the back of your leg, like people said. You know, you, although some people that don't have, uh, um, that don't have rods and cones, what you didn't see in that photo is there are certain people that are born without rods and cones that still have uh, melanopsin uh, ganglion. They found, this was NASA research that they found this out from, uh, from uh, looking at frogs and reptiles. Um, here. So, these are your rods and cones. This is what takes light and turns them into a picture in the back of your, your brain back here. Okay? So, people that don't have those have mel still make melanopsin. They still have retinal ganglia that make melanopsin, and they do fine. It's just the people that don't have intact retinas. Then what they're get doing is giving them melatonin. And there's just come out with a new 24-hour prepara preparation of melatonin. Uh, the Israelis have circadin, which is what I like to use with my guys and gals that travel. That it mimics the same curve as, as the melatonin curve that you see, versus just giving a big dose bolus of melatonin. It actually gives you that long curve. So that here's that long curve. You just flew to Moscow, so you're trying to go to sleep here, okay? And it takes you nine days to slowly get that melatonin curve here, unless you use light and melatonin, then you can get it here in about three days. Okay. So if you're trying to go to bed here and there's no melatonin on board, you can take melatonin. It gives it to you. So Dr. Johnson, power time is up to oh, yeah. here and I know this gentleman is this gentleman, but uh, you gave your information at the end that if there was Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, if they wanted to contact you with other questions and or comments. Yeah, I mean, smith.l.johnston at nasa.gov. Okay, so you're in the global. Yep. That's the coronary disease we do. All right. Aww. Let's see. I was at the end. Yeah, right here. So it's smith.l at nasa.gov. That's my mobile. And I don't have my, you know, I'm in the global. You guys, you guys will can find me. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you again. You. Thank you all.